Life Audio. When you feel at the end of your rope, when you feel burned out, when you feel discouraged, when you feel like you failed, when you feel like the world is letting you down, you are close to the kingdom of God. There's something about understanding that we have got to come to the end of ourselves to fully enter into the blessing of God. Hey everyone, welcome back to How to Study the Bible. I am your host, Nicole Eunice, and I am so glad to be here with you today. We are in this series where we're just flying up as high as we can uh, above scripture to explore what Jesus teaches us about himself as we approach Easter. So we're doing like, hey, if there was five things that you needed to know about Jesus, this is what they would be. And these are the the things that he did in his earthly ministry and how those impact us today. So we're calling that series Jesus 101. And today's session is on the kingdom. So we're going to be talking about that in just a moment. But if you're new here, I just want to say I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you found us. And I want you to know that each and every week we take a passage of scripture and we just spend a few minutes together discovering what God has for us in his word. This episode is brought to you by He Gets Us, a nationwide campaign all about raising the respect and relevance of Jesus. Did you see the Super Bowl ads about Jesus? Are you wondering how you can get involved? He Gets Us is a multi-year effort to raise the respect and relevance of Jesus in the United States. Thanks to this unprecedented campaign, millions of Americans are discovering the life-changing impact of Jesus, and we want you to be a part of the movement. Join more than 45,000 He Gets Us fans getting the latest updates, inspiration, prayer ideas, and easy-to-share resources via text message by subscribing to our fans' community. To do so, text FANS to 70193. By being a fan, you can get exclusive updates on new ads, events, and other exciting news related to the He Gets Us movement. We'll also keep you inspired by giving you access to reading plans, prayer guides, and other tools to help on your spiritual journey. Join this community of like-minded individuals, who share your passion for spreading the love of Jesus. Simply text FANS to 70193 to join today. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. So bit by bit, week by week, We are putting ourselves under God's word to discover what he teaches us and asking ourselves four really simple questions. Now, simple does not mean that it's not complex to try to like dig in and understand, but the questions themselves are simple. So the questions that we ask of each passage of scripture is, what does it say? And this is how we're kind of observing what's going on in the passage. What's the backstory? What context do we need? And we're going to hear a lot about context today, particularly in this passage. What does it mean? What's the timeless truth? What's the the principle that I can pull from this passage that God intends for us for all time? It's the same meaning then as it is now. And then after we do all that work, then we say, okay, what does this mean for me? How do I apply this to my life? Because friends, if being in scripture is not transforming your heart, then it's a wasted time. It's We're not supposed to be people who are just puffed up in knowledge, as it says in 1 Corinthians. We're supposed to be people who are built up in love. But the knowledge of God that we find through his word is actually what can build us up in love if we enter into it with sort of the proper perspective and the right understanding of what we're reading together. So I'm going to pray for us as we get into today's passage. Would you join me? Take a deep breath and get ready to be with the Lord. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you that you give us a mind and a heart to pursue you. Lord, I pray that we would hunger and thirst evermore for understanding and for righteousness, and that you would help us, Holy Spirit, to know exactly how this passage applies to each and every one of us today. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you guys. So we, week one, we talked about Jesus's baptism and this idea that his identity is secure before he does anything else, before he does any miracles, before he does any teaching, before he goes to the cross, his identity is secure and that in Christ, our identity also can be secure. We also can be identified as children of God who are well-loved, who are approved of through Christ. So then week two, we talked about temptation. And right after Jesus's baptism, he is led into the desert for 40 days to be tested by the devil. And we see in those temptations, the exact ways that the enemy comes against our identity and the the things, the lures that tempt us also to act independent of God, to act outside of obedience with God. And those are important things chronologically that happened in Jesus's life before what happens next. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter five. We're going to try to talk a little bit about Sermon on the Mount. But friends, there is no way in this 15 minutes that we could possibly dive into the depths of how beautiful This message is in some ways, many, many commentators have called this the greatest sermon ever told because this is Jesus's manifesto about what it means to be on the right path with God and what it looks like to pursue a good life and to pursue a godly life. And so we're not going to cover all of that. But if anything, I want you to know, please spend time in these passages, Matthew 5, 6 and 7. This is the kind of stuff that you want to read again and again and again, because what you're going to discover is that this really is Jesus's like memo of what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. And we live in the kingdom of the world right now. We are constantly surrounded by a culture that wants to shape us, wants to form us, right? We're always being formed by what we're around. And so we need to be around the things of the kingdom of God if we want to be formed by the kingdom of God. And one of the ways we get around that is by spending time reading the stuff that Jesus said and reading it again and again. So Matthew 5, 6, and 7, what I want to do today is I want to talk about the very beginning of the passage. I'm going to give you a quick flyover of some of the things that you might notice in those chapters as you go and do your own reading. And then we're going to finish with what happens right at the very end of this teaching. Okay, so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, the first three verses today. Okay, and this is what it says. This is right after... Jesus has gone through the temptation. He's called some of his disciples. He's beginning to do some miracles. And it says, Matthew 5, verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the passage goes on from there with several blessings. That little passage is called the Beatitudes. So before we get into more of the passage, let's just stop and ask the question, what does this say? Sometimes one of the ways that I kind of make sure I understand what a passage says is I'm like, okay, wait, who are the characters in this passage? Okay, so when we look at this just first verse, it says there's Jesus, there's the crowds, and then there's the disciples, right? There's sort of three groups happening here. And this is really, really important, I think, for our understanding today because it says when Jesus saw the crowds, he went away. He went up a mountainside. He went away from them. It doesn't say he went toward the crowds. He went up a mountainside and he sat down. And then it says who came to him? His disciples came to him. The message version says his climbing companions came to him. And so there is sort of an understanding here that only those who were interested in what Jesus had to say followed him. There were a lot of crowds around because there's been healing and miracles. But when Jesus saw the crowds, what he did is he went up and sat down. And so we might want to pay attention to that. Like, again, remember, everything in scripture is there for a reason. Every word is there for a reason. So if you don't understand something, you may want to be like, huh, I wonder why the Bible wants me to know that. Like, why does the Bible want me to know that Jesus was on a mountainside and that Jesus sat down? So let's hold on to those two things. And then we know, okay, only his disciples came to him. And I think in this context, we don't mean just like the two people he's called so far, but The people who are interested in what Jesus had to say are the ones who followed him. And then he began to teach. And the very first things he says is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So for me, of course, I'm like, okay, blessed. Let's like, how would I define blessed? Like, what does that mean? Because that word has been co-opted by our culture. So I need to understand what blessed is. Okay, poor in spirit. That's an interesting phrase. I know what poor is, I think. I know what the spirit is, but what is poor in spirit? 
and then this phrase kingdom of heaven, right? So before we even get into the next several chapters, we can start right here and say, okay, there's probably a couple of things that I would want to understand at the outset before I went any further in this passage. So there's the things that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Jesus sitting on the mountainside, what blessed means, what poor in spirit means, what kingdom of heaven means. Like if we just started with those four as our like four questions that we have of this passage. And now we're going to ask the question, the next question we always ask in our Bible study, which is what's the backstory? So there's backstory that we probably are seeking right now. And it's perfectly appropriate that you wouldn't necessarily know what that backstory is, which is why I'm always, always talking to you guys about your study Bible, because your study Bible can give you the context that can help you sort of paint the picture and understand the fullness and the meaning of what's actually happening in this passage. Okay, so if you've got your study Bible, you can look at this passage and see that there's probably a couple of things right at the outset in your study Bible that is going to talk about. And one of those things is that it says right in the beginning in the text note, the Sermon on the Mount is in effect King Jesus's inaugural address explaining what he expects of members of his kingdom. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? I don't know why I love that so much. That King Jesus is going to go up in the mountainside, he's going to sit down and he's going to say, hey guys, this is what it means to be in my kingdom. And then he says this thing that is not what I think you would expect to hear, which is blessed are the poor in spirit. Like, I don't even know exactly what poor in the spirit means. Like if we're going to, if we're going to play that out, we might not know what that means already, but already wouldn't your ears be caught by that? Because that's not normally what you would think that a king would say. Like a king might say like, my kingdom's full of the best and the brightest, you know, my kingdom's full of people who are passionate. But no, it's like, no, my kingdom is full of people who are poor in spirit. And those are the people that are actually blessed. So in context, if we talk about this idea of Jesus going and sitting down, that it says right before that, what our text note's going to tell us is that rabbis sat down when they were preparing to teach. And what we also know, because we talked about it last week, is that the book of Matthew, particularly where this is found, Matthew's gospel is going to help us understand how Jesus is the fulfillment of Hebrew Jewish people's prophecies of the Old Testament. This episode is brought to you by He Gets Us a nationwide campaign all about raising the respect and relevance of Jesus. Did you see the Super Bowl ads about Jesus? Are you wondering how you can get involved? He Gets Us is a multi-year effort to raise the respect and relevance of Jesus in the United States. Thanks to this unprecedented campaign, millions of Americans are discovering the life-changing impact of Jesus. And we want you to be a part of the movement. Join more than 45,000 He Gets Us fans getting the latest updates, inspiration, prayer ideas, and easy-to-share resources via text message by subscribing to our fans community. To do so, text FANS to 70193. By being a fan, you can get exclusive updates on new ads, events, and other exciting news related to the He Gets Us movement. We'll also keep you inspired by giving you access to reading plans, prayer guides, and other tools to help on your spiritual journey. Join this community of like-minded individuals who share your passion for spreading the love of Jesus. Simply text FANS to 70193 to join today. Our world can feel chaotic and uncertain, but we don't have to live enslaved to fear. Christ has promised you and I His peace, and throughout Scripture, He has provided powerful truths and practical steps to help us experience greater freedom. I'm Jennifer Slattery, lead host of the Faith Over Fear podcast, inviting you to join me and my team as together we learn how to starve our fears and grow our faith. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. And so Jesus going up to a mountainside, you know who else went up on a mountainside and got the law? Moses. And we know that this idea that Jesus is going back up on a mountainside, he's sitting down as a teacher, he's explaining what the kingdom of it's like, he's, he's redoing all that is Israel's history. And he's representing now the new Moses in his way of saying, like, I'm here to give you this understanding, this teaching. So he sits down and as a, as sitting down on a mountain, he's he's preparing to reinstate in some ways. What does it actually mean to be in the kingdom? And then the first word he uses is blessed. Now, if you were 
one of the people who was very familiar with scripture, familiar with the Old Testament, and you were listening to Jesus, you would know that blessing, this concept of blessing, we really see play out all through the Old Testament. But one of the particular ways is in Psalm 1. And Psalm 1, if I turn back there, it starts, blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit and season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So we have this picture of what it looks like to be blessed from Psalm 1. And when he uses the word blessed, when Jesus uses the word blessed, he means this word that isn't blessed like happy or lucky. He isn't using blessed like, hey, your material circumstances make you better off than everyone else. It actually means to be on the right path, to be on the right road. So being blessed by Jesus means you're you're going on the right direction. Like here's how you can get on the right track. So if we're asking the question, what does it look like to operate in the kingdom of God? The first thing Jesus says is, this is what it looks like to get on the right track. That's what blessing actually means. So when we talk about blessing in scripture or being blessed in scripture, it means God is orienting me on the right track, the track that leads to righteousness and goodness and fullness of him. And it it, it doesn't mean God is blessing me because I just got a pay raise. Now, it's not that God can't bless us through a pay raise. But we need to understand that blessing is such a bigger concept than a circumstance, a parking spot, a good day. Blessing is about this understanding, oh, like my life is oriented on the right road. And the very first group of people that Jesus says are oriented on the right road are those who are poor in spirit to get to our kind of next context thing. Poor in spirit. This phrase doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament. It's only here. So we can't just flip through our Bible and be like, oh, let's look at this somewhere else and we'll understand it better. We've got to interpret it in context. And of course, that means we've got to kind of wrestle through it. But if we were going to ask ourselves what poor in spirit means, I think we could also think about what would be the opposite of poor in spirit, right? And the the opposite to me of poor in spirit would be like, self-righteous or sort of self-defined in my own like pride of my spirituality. Like I'm already right, right? Like poor in spirit is sort of like I'm bereft of the sort of pride of, of being right or the pride of being knowledgeable. That's not who I am. And I love that in the message version, again, Eugene Peterson uses the phrase, blessed are you when you're at the end of your rope. And I think that this idea of being poor in spirit is like this being like out of breath, right? So a friend of mine who's a Bible scholar, you guys are going to meet her. She's going to come on the podcast. In her interpretation, both in Greek and Hebrew, the word spirit means breath, right? So we could probably go ahead and insert this idea. Poor in spirit is like out of breath. <laughs> you're out of breath. <laughs> you're, you're worn out. You're burned out. You are feeling the weight of the world. You're feeling the experience that being a human being is hard. And here is Jesus going up, sitting down, taking the authority as a rabbi and saying, I'm going to redefine what human flourishing looks like. And the first thing that we're going to redefine is that when you feel at the end of your rope, when you feel burned out, when you feel discouraged, when you feel like you failed, when you feel like the world is letting you down, you are close to the kingdom of God. There's something about understanding that we have got to come to the end of ourselves to fully enter into the blessing of God. You know that feeling when you're like, I just don't have anything left. Like, I don't have any place to go. And there's something about the end of the road Christian who's like, I got I got nothing to bring to the table and I've got nowhere to go that makes our hearts so open to receive from the Lord. It makes our hearts open just broken open for God to meet us in that place and to provide for us. So in this really kind of weird, but also beautiful way, Jesus says, hey, you're most blessed when you run out of yourself. And then he takes it from there. And and I want to stop there for for this week. And we probably are going to return to Sermon on the Mount sometime this year because it'd be so great to teach through it. But what we need to know is that before you get into any other instruction, before you get into understanding more of the way that Jesus helps us interpret the world and his inaugural address about the kingdom of God, you need to understand this first part, the very first thing that Jesus says. 
He claims his authority. He says to those who come with him, so you got to be interested enough to want to listen to Jesus. He says to those who will come with him, here is the way that you are going to experience blessing. The very first thing is like this refreshing invitation, like, hey, if you're honest with yourself and you're worn out, burned out, beat down, feeling like a failure, have nothing left, no more coping mechanisms, nothing up your sleeve. If that's who you are, you are blessed. You are coming close to the kingdom of God because your heart is open to receive the gifts that Jesus has. That is the beautiful blessing of life in Christ. So from there, the passage continues, right? But for us in our you know question, what is the backstory? That's what we can cover for today, okay? So now we ask, what does it mean, right? What does this mean? And I want to fly over a little bit more Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I want to give you kind of three categories that I think happen in these chapters if you're going to go read them for yourself. The first is that Jesus redefines human flourishing. That's what we saw today. He's going to talk about humanity and what makes for a blessed life very differently than the way we experience culture then when it was written and also now. The what we consider a good life is very different than what Jesus says is a good life. The second thing that Jesus does is he redefines human ethic. He talks about what it looks like to actually be a good neighbor and what does it mean to be a person who cares about other people. And he also does that in a really countercultural way. Now, we have a little bit more of that in our culture today, but at the time that it was first written, it would have been absolutely revolutionary. And I think if you really dig in and dive down, it still is. We may have some niceties in our culture about how we operate with other people, but we still operate on a pretty strong ledger system. Like you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And Jesus gives us a completely different human ethic to look at in these chapters and also through his whole life. And then the third thing he does is he redefines a good life of practice, of spiritual practices. And we learn about fasting and praying and giving in these chapters as well. So I want to, I hope that gives you enough to be excited about exploring them for yourself. So. When we ask, what does it mean? And we want to pull out kind of what is our, what is our timeless truth? What is the principle that we can take from today? And I think for me, if I was going to name just one principle from Matthew 5, 1 through 3, it's that Jesus is looking for those who are looking for him and who are out of options. Jesus is seeking those who are looking for him and are out of options. And, or maybe Jesus is seeking those who are out of options and then sort of default to looking for him. I don't, I don't know which of those it is, but that's my working theory that I'm applying to the passage. And I'm asking myself, of course, what does it mean for me? I'm like, what does it mean for me? Do I show up like that with Jesus? Am I okay with that being true? Am I ready to take off the masks and the ways that I pretend to be okay? the ways that I pretend to have it together or the comfortable ways that I try to deal with my own self and my own life without really inviting God in? Am I ready to put those down? Because what Jesus says is that, hey, you're on the right path when you're poor in spirit. You're on the right path when you realize that you don't have all the answers and you don't have everything you need within yourself and you don't really know where you're going. And he's like, I'm, I'm inviting you to follow me. Which, which of course means by default that I'm no longer following my own way, my own path, but I'm deciding to follow his path. And I think that's the invitation for all of us. What I love about life in Christ is that he's constantly inviting us in to this kind of life. This isn't just a one-time invitation to start following him. Choosing to follow Jesus is a daily practice. It is a daily exercise. And recognizing our own poverty of spirit is a daily practice and a daily exercise. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus is waiting to meet us in that place, to fill us up, to be our peace, to be his presence in our life that directs and guides us onto what that right path looks like. So at the very end of the Beatitudes, at the end of this teaching, Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29 says, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Friends, what Jesus did, King Jesus in his inaugural address, what Jesus did was he showed the people that he's not just another religious leader. He's not just a really special teacher, that Jesus has authority and that his authority comes because he is fully God and fully man. He is the word made flesh. He is the one 
who was able to say definitively, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone who comes to the Father must come through me. It's a beautiful teaching. It's a true teaching. It's a challenging teaching, but it's one that I'm willing to put my life behind, and I hope that you are too. Talk with you next week. How to Study the Bible with Nicole Eunice is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you like what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review the podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. This Easter, we want to invite you on a journey back to first century Palestine as we dive deeper into the lives of Simon Peter, Judas, Pilate, John, Mary Magdalene, and others in the Characters of Easter podcast. Hosted by Daniel Darling, the Characters of Easter will help you become acquainted with the unlikely people who witness the miracle of Christ's death and resurrection. Enter into their stories and ultimately draw closer to Christ Himself as you encounter Him through their experiences. This free 11-episode podcast provides a fresh approach to the Lenten season and can be used as a devotional or study for both individuals and groups. Visit lifeaudio.com today or search for the Characters of Easter in your favorite podcast app.